Welcome to the Process Breakdown Podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company, getting rid of bottlenecks, and giving your employees all the information they need to be successful at their jobs. Now, let's get started with the show. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, host of the Process Breakdown Podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company, getting rid of bottlenecks, and giving your staff everything they need to be successful at their job. Aaron, I know that's exactly what you do. We're going to talk about it. Um, past guests include David Allen of Getting Things Done, Michael Gerber of The E-Myth, and many more. Check out other episodes. Before I talk to today's guest, Aaron Matthey, who is uh, a process, you know, just she's a process ninja. So we're going to talk about that. Um, the episode is brought to you by Sweet Process. So if you've had team members ask you the same questions over and over again, and I'm sure you don't know any companies that that happens with, um, and it's the 10th time they spent explaining it, there's a better way, there's a better solution. Sweet Process is a software that makes it drop dead easy to train and onboard new staff and save time with existing staff. Um, so not only do universities, banks, hospitals, software companies use it, but I was talking to the owner, Owen, and he told me, a first responder government agency uses it for in life or death situations. I guess pretty cool. I have to mention that. So you can use Sweet Process to document all the repetitive tasks that eat up your precious time. So you can focus on growing your team and your company. You can sign up for a 14 day free trial. No credit card required. Sweetprocess.com. Sweet like candy. S W E E T process.com. Aaron, I am excited to introduce to uh, you to everyone else. Aaron Matthew founded business made simple in 2013. They've helped hundreds of businesses from all around the world organize and systemize their businesses to run smoothly so they can live life more fully. And they help companies document their processes and develop them into standard operating procedures. And Erin hails from Utah and she has three boys. And so you are, you need to be like the ultimate of processes and systems when you have to run a household, not let alone other businesses, right? Absolutely. Yep. I think I've systemized my house as well as my own business and other <laughs> businesses is what I love to do. <laughs> Let's, um, you know, we're going to dig deep into where do people start tackling their SOPs, but I figured I was looking at your website. There's a company waste and water that you worked with. Yeah. What did they come yeah, to you I with? Yeah, so waste and water, some of the issues that they came to us with is that they're a growing team that manages, they have a lot of trucks that they're trying to manage, an office team, um, they're working on dispatch to send out trucks everywhere. And where they're really struggling is that their office staff would rotate. And because the office, they didn't have any real systems developed or documented, what happened is when their office manager left, the whole business fell apart. <laughs> and whoever came in next, there was a big lag time for them to redevelop their own way of doing it, train the rest of the team how to work with that office manager. Um, and there's just a lot of lost time there and inefficiencies. And so when their, stand when their office manager leaves now, um, they can hire someone to now and say, here's our proven system. This is what is actually working. Um, we work to fill the holes and have everything documented so that now they have this process where if she's out sick for the day um, or it leaves for some reason, they have somebody that can step right in and be able to, to pick up where they left off. Huge, huge, massive change for that company. Yeah. And Aaron, I'm going to talk, I want to have you talk about what you did for them, but you know, it just makes me think if anyone listening right now are worried if someone leaves, what's going to happen, right? Then that is a sign you need to create a system for it, right? And so, you know, there's always those people in the company, oh my God, this person's amazing. I don't know what I would do if they ever left, right? So people are thinking that that means you need to start documenting, right? And so what did you do with them first when they say, so like, okay, we need to figure out this office manager position? Yeah, so the best place to start for this particular company was to look at what does this office manager do? Let's write out what their job description is. And the job description really covers the what, right? So what do you want them to do on a daily basis? What are their responsibilities? And then once you have that part documented, the next thing that you can do is to take each one of those pieces of the job description and write the how. That's what becomes your standard operating procedure. And so the how will then support um, that job description. 
how detailed do you get with that? Like, what would be an example of something that maybe someone said to you, Aaron, like, are we getting a little too granular, but it was really important? Yeah, that's a great question. Really, the amount of detail that you need depends on what the risk factor is if that process is not followed. So, for example, if you are looking at um, somebody that's saying, hey, here's the process that we follow on who to call or how to call customers and let them know that a truck is on their way and will be arriving shortly. The risk factor, if that, doesn't fall, if that process doesn't happen, is fairly low. So you don't need to get super crazy detailed in it. Obviously, if you're working in like a nuclear power plant, <laughs> the risk factor is really high. So if that doesn't, if that process isn't followed, it can be catastrophic. And so in those cases, you need a lot more detail. The goal is to provide information for people that's actually useful. So you don't need to tell them how to turn a doorknob to go into the office, but you do want to make sure that everything that they're going to need to be able to do their job successfully is well documented. Yeah. Now that's a good point. Thinking of what are the highest risk factors if it fails, what would be an example? It doesn't have to be with that company, any company that you've seen that this would be considered a high risk factor and this is how detailed it was. Yeah. So one example of that um, is a company that we worked with that was having a lot of issues with actually collecting on, on work that had been fulfilled. <laughs> and so we needed to get very detailed from the salesperson describing exactly how the invoice process is going to work, how to collect contract pieces to ensure that they were going to collect payment at the end of it, all the way through to exactly how to invoice, how to follow up if the invoice is not collected. So days, times, scripts, um, you know, how you add in all of the extra fees, when to turn it over to collections, all of that stuff really need to, to be in place because they had millions of dollars of overdue invoices. Wow. They must have loved you for putting something together that collected that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Was that a combination with that process of, um, bef were some of the, the things they were able to solve before the fact? You know, like after the fact is not collected, but were there some things that you put in place so that it prevented that from happening, getting that far along in the process? Or was it just people who were delinquent on their bills that couldn't have been avoided? No, absolutely. I think with any time you're running into a headache in the business, and in this case, there was overdue invoices, you need to look at how, how can we create a process that will prevent this from happening on our customer's end. So definitely, I mean, there's still going to be some people that you've got to have this whole collections process with. But in reality, you didn't teach your customers with a process what you needed from them at the beginning. And so the more that you can preempt with good processes, you can prevent so many customer service issues and other fulfillment issues by thinking about the larger process. Yeah, was, you know, I'm sure a lot of companies have this issue, um, collections. Was yeah. there something you could remember in the beginning that you put in as a preventative measure um, to communicate with the customer so that it didn't get down? Because oftentimes we discover oh my God, this person hasn't paid in three months. And then you, you have to go back to them three months later, whereas you could have done this in the beginning. What was a preventive measure you put in place so that maybe everyone could use that as far as their collections yeah. go? Yeah. So what we did with that is we actually went through initially and wrote it as part of the script when they were initially closing that sale to let them know this is what the invoice is. The other piece that we did was to say, put in a, a stop, gate where we say work does not progress past this point if we've not received a 50% down payment. Mm. We're, and so putting in those stop gates to make sure that, you know, we all want to over love and over serve our customers. And I'm all about that. But it's also about setting what the expectations are so that you can have a great working relationship with your yeah. customer. Do you have an elegant way of saying that? I feel like maybe I care too much. And that makes me nervous to say, we're stopping work. We're stopping doing work. Is there a, uh, like a nice way of saying that? Because we do care about our customers and you don't want to say that, but sometimes that you have to do that, right? Yeah. Is there a nice yeah. way of saying that, Erin, um, that people can use? Yeah, what I've seen a lot is um, when I, I find it's often helpful when you're getting on the call to have a checkpoint to say, hey, has the invoice been happened if you're doing um, service calls or if you're getting on a Zoom call with somebody and you say, hey, I'm so excited to talk with you today about da 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 da. Um, and I noticed that we haven't had your invoice paid yet. 
Um, can we take care of that real quick before we progress on with our call today? Mm, I like that. They should have you do that call. No, I'm just <laughs> um, so SOPs, right? Um, the non-sexy things that make businesses work smoothly. Um, people, the people, companies you work with, where do they fall in? What camps do they fall into? Do they fall into uh, we don't have an SOP, we have an SOP, but don't use it? Or like, where do people typically fall? Yeah, so a lot of people that we work with are either in this point where they think that I don't have any processes, but really they do. And we can talk more about that. Or they fall into this point of, look, we know how to do business, but we don't have anything documented. Um, and we don't know how to teach our team how to develop the systems type mindset so that they will be a part of improving this process and that they will refer back to that standard operating procedure to ensure that we're developing those really consistent results with our customers. So when you do that, they come in like, Aaron, we don't have anything. Where do you start? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think where you start with your standard operating procedures really depends on what is your motivation for wanting to have them in the first place. And usually we run into three different motivations. So the first motivation is sometimes I want to document everything so that I can franchise, um, so that I can sell the business and be able to get a good revenue on that. If, you're, if your process is, I want to, one motivation is I want to document everything. The other motivation that we hear a lot is I need to make a new hire, but I don't know what to tell them to do yet. And so that's another motivation. And then the third motivation is I am completely overwhelmed and I've got to delegate some things, but I am not able to delegate effectively because the process has not been developed. So let's talk about how you would deal with each one of those motivations. So if your motivation is I want to document everything, then what I recommend that you do there is you start with a table of contents outline. So don't worry about writing any of the processes out, but start putting in a list together of all the processes that you need to write. Um, and then it'll become clear where you need to, where you need to go from there. Um, if your motivation is, hey, I'm ready to make a new hire, then I would start with the job description for that hire. So what do you want them to, to do? And then write the related standard operating procedures for how to do those pieces. And if your motivation is, I've just got too much to do and I need to delegate more, then just start writing the standard operating procedures for the pieces that you want to delegate. Because it is never successful to delegate before you've defined what the process is. Mm. And you talk about um, developing an SOP mindset. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think sometimes when people think standard operating procedures we get a view of the guy from office space with like a big binder and he's you know saying <laughs> thinking oh Dwight I've got no, yes okay. you know you're, you've got to have some crazy binder from the 90s that's not what a modern standard <laughs> operating procedure looks like <laughs> but what a standard operating procedure um this mindset that you need in order to be able to do that is to realize that your standard operating procedure is never going to be complete it's always going to be evolving because business, the nature of business itself is always evolving. And it's great to live in a time when we have the ability to have things hosted on online platforms like Sweet Process where you can change and it will automatically, the updated version is what people are always seeing. So I think people need to remember that it's never done, it's always evolving, and it's, um, it, but it's something that you have to incorporate into your culture. So one of the things that we recommend is that you are reviewing your standard operating procedure at each team meeting and just saying, not reviewing the whole thing, obviously, but just putting in a line item that says what processes need to be developed and documented and what's outdated that needs to be fixed. Hmm. And really um, including your team on that to make it more of a team effort to be able to realize that, hey, we are developing a system. Um, for how to run the business and you are all a part of that system. Some of you are on the front lines and we need your feedback to make sure that things are, are moving smoothly. Yeah, I love that because reviewing it is key. And I feel like the people I've talked to and myself included, um, if something falls through the cracks or something doesn't get done, it's a sign you need to go back to the systems document and see what is wrong with it. So there should always be a review of it because I mean, nothing's, no system is perfect. And so if something is lost, they can go right back to see what to fix, right? Exactly, yeah. And part of that too is really getting the team on board with knowing that this is the tool that's here for you and this is what you're accountable to. 
you know, these are the rules that we play the game by. Um, Cause it's, it's frustrating for employees too. when when you ask them to do something, but don't tell them the rules to success. Right. And so it's super helpful for them to be able to have those standard operating procedures up, um, you know, saved on a bookmark on their computer where if they're like, oh, I haven't done this process in a while. Let me jump in and review it instead of trying to pull it out of my brain and remember what worked or didn't work last time. What are some of the mistakes, Aaron, that people make when creating standard operating procedures or starting to go through this process? Yeah, that's a great question. A couple of mistakes that I see frequently is the perfectionist mindset, right? Of I can't roll it out. Are you talking directly to me, Aaron? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Maybe, (laughs) maybe. (laughs) But thinking I can't roll it out to my team until it's 100% complete and perfect. That's not true. So you can get value out of it as it continues to build. Um, another Check, mis- I make that mistake. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> another um, common mistake that I see a lot is that people um, are creating the process themselves but not having anybody else review it. It really is helpful to have somebody that doesn't know the process look at it to be able to say, I don't get it. Because if you've been doing something for a long time, you know exactly how to run a podcast. But somebody else, if they were trying totally. to step in, they would not know exactly what you meant by that. Yeah. So it's helpful. You to have jump around, you're missing steps because you're just kind of doing them intuitively. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the perfectionist and not having someone review. Uh-huh. Any, any, any else? Any uh, other yeah. big mistakes? Yeah. Some of the other ones that I see, that we've already talked about, like not reviewing it on a regular basis. Um, but another one that I see that's, that's really common is that people will have, the documents stored somewhere where they're not accessible to people. So it's stored on somebody's desktop that doesn't even use that process. And they've got four versions of it because they're not sure what the most updated version is. And, you know, it's pointless to write a standard operating procedure if nobody can look at it. (laughs) So you've got to make sure that it's accessible and that you know that the team is required to look at it and know what that what's on there and that that's their standard that they're held accountable to. And then you tell them it's called the cloud. There's stuff that lives in the cloud. That's right. (laughs) As long as everyone has access to that cloud. I know, um, you know, you're big on processes, automations, and and we mentioned one of the, you know, we mentioned sweet process as a, as a tool. What are some of the other tools um, like from a automation standpoint that you recommend? Software. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so there's so many. Um, I I think every company definitely needs a CRM to be able to track their customers. Mm -hmm. And they also need a project management tool. Um, There's lots of different combinations of those. Mm -hmm. um, What do you you see people using from a CRM and project management? One that I love that incorporates both of them, both CRM and project management is called Insightly. And we do a lot of Insightly set up for customers because it's a great way to be able to manage that sales process and to manage that fulfillment process of, you know, handling all the projects. So you definitely need those things in play. Um, another piece that's, I mean, my, one of my personal favorite ones to play with that I think every, com- every company should start playing with is Zapier. It just mm-hmm. will connect so many different software pieces and create automations that, I mean, let's stop all double entry into softwares, please. Let's please stop having to enter in contact information into four different softwares. And so I love Zapier. It's a fun one to play with and it's pretty easy to be able to code things in Zapier. What do you, um, and Zapier is amazing, uh, by the way. Um, I've talked to Wade Foster before, but um, what do you tend to connect? You pretty much connect everything, but you have a go-to like connection with Zapier? Yeah, so definitely, I think some of the most common ones that I see is getting your web form to connect to your CRM, getting your CRM to connect to your email service provider and to your project management tool and to your um, finance software. So we do a lot of pushes from from those pieces to make sure that those are all integrated. Before you start, what did you want to do before you started this company? (laughs) Erin, what were you doing? So my history, of course, you know, entrepreneur takes you on interesting paths, right? So um, I'm a, my college degree was in biology and chemistry. So naturally, I'm a business consultant, yeah, right? Me so too. Mine was biochemistry. So. Oh, really? I yeah. love it. <laughs> so it's kind of funny to see how the path takes. But uh, my path to doing this was I started um, as a science teacher. 
And then I started a tutoring company. Oh, cool. And in my tutoring company, um, I have started out just me doing all the things, right? I built my own hideous website. I did all the pieces of that initial business. And then eventually I grew to the point where, you know, I could do everything until I got successful, right? And then once I got successful, I needed to start hiring more out. So what I found that I really loved was the ability to create processes and then pass them off to my employees. So eventually I got to the point where I had 23 employees and I was down to working like two hours a week and I ran out of things to systemize. So I started doing that in other companies. <laughs> and I ended up, yeah. and then I ended up selling my tutoring company and starting Business Made Simple. That's awesome. Um, first of all, Aaron, thank you. I want people to check out your website and then go to business-made-simple.com to check out more. You can check out more episodes of the podcast and check out Sweet Process. Last question, Aaron, is so people are wanting to start systemizing. Where should they start now? What's the next step they should take? Yeah, I think one of my favorite things to do to start systemizing is to grab some of those great big sticky notes. A lot of people don't know they make like a two foot by three foot sticky note. Start with those and start thinking through your process. Start mapping it out and thinking, why are we doing it this way? You know, there's an old story about somebody that was um, making, making a roast and they cut off both ends of the roast. And she's like, why do we do that? So she called her mom, mom, why do we cut off both ends of the roast? And she said, I don't know, that's the way my mom did it. And so called grandma and grandma says, oh, cause my pan's only this big. You know, and so um, I think taking a look at your process, how you're currently doing it, and just mapping it all out on those big sticky notes and seeing where your inefficiencies are, and I, it'll become pretty clear where you need to go from there. Yeah, it's so, so valuable to do those things because you will discover <clears throat> efficiencies that can make you and your staff save time, save money, make more money. So Aaron, I just wanted the first one to thank you. Everyone, check out the website, check out more episodes. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Process Breakdown Podcast. Before you go, quick question. Do you want a tool that makes it easy to document processes, procedures, and or policies for your company so that your employees have all the information they need to be successful at their job? If yes, sign up for a free 14-day trial of Sweet Process. No credit card is required to sign up. Go to sweetprocess.com, sweet like candy, and process like process.com. Go now to sweetprocess.com and sign up for your risk-free 14-day trial. That's right.